Grandpa was a prince? At the time, your grandpa was a young man, and the father of the Shah confiscated everything he owned. And since his entourage was uneducated, your grandpa was named Prime Minister. He had studied in Europe. He was a very cultivated man. He had even read Marx. Once he was sidetracked from his princely destiny, he began to meet intellectuals. So he became a communist. So he was often sent to prison. Sometimes they put him in a cell filled with water for hours. That night I stayed a very long time in the bath. I wanted to know what it felt like to be in a cell filled with water. My hands were wrinkled when I came out, like Grandpa's. Hello and welcome once again to The Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. We are reading, this time around, Marjan Satrapi's Persepolis. And um, we're sharing it on the occasion of Persian New Year, so happy Nowruz. Nowruz Mubarak. <laughs> is, that, is this something you celebrate? We do. The first time I celebrated it was when I was living with um, the person who's the father of my kids. And um, we celebrated it spontaneously. This is New York in 1988. And it was evening and we knew that New Year was coming at some time like way in the wee hours. It's at a different time every year because it's um, the time of the equinox. So sometimes it's in the middle of the day, sometimes it's the early morning, sometimes at night. So on this particular day, it was going to be late at night. And we decided spontaneously spontaneously to do it. And when you want to celebrate Noru's, you have to have what's called the half scene, uh, seven things that start with S, as well as candles and a mirror. Are they specific things that start with S or just anything? Well, it varies a little bit how people do it, but there are some standard ones. So seeb, which is garlic, um, seken, which is vinegar, sabze, which is grass that's growing, sabzi, which is like herbs. And anyway, so it's a bunch of different things. So you get, we went to the store, like convenience store in New York in the East Village at that time, got a bunch of what we needed, but we couldn't find one thing that was absolutely essential for the table, which is sombol, which is usually like hyacinths or tulips, like some some kind of bulb flower. So we roam the streets. It's getting late at night, getting closer and closer to the time of Nowruz. And we finally found a planter that had some um, crocuses in it outside of NYU. And so we stole a few of them and took them <laughs> home and planted them in a teacup on the table. So it was a very memorable Nowruz, very successful. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> so this is also the first comic book that we're going to be looking at or graphic novel or however you want to call it. It's a genre you know pretty well, right? I know it well enough. I, I certainly have read a, a fair number of them, although I, I, I'm not going to pretend to be a, an expert. Uh, have you read many? No, very few. I mean, it, it, I'm kind of really curious about it as a genre. And so I've dipped into it, but it's not something I have a real sense of. Like, I don't have kind of, I guess you could say, kind of a conceptual vocabulary for things like differences between um, works that define themselves as comic versus graphic novel and like the, and all the different forms and the kind of cultural valences they have. Like if you think about things like manga and so on, like these are inhabiting different parts of that visual culture landscape that I'm not that familiar with. Well, Persepolis is one of those graphic novels or whatever you want to call them that people who don't read graphic novels tend to have read, if you see what I mean, mm -hmm. uh, along with something like Art Spiegelman's Mouse. And in interviews, Satrapi has said that Mouse was the book that made her get comic books or realize that she could write, realize what comic books could do, this sort of hybrid historical memoir exploratory form. Mm. But on her, I mean, she's trained as a graphic artist too, right? So how can I put it? It's not a case of the visual being an afterthought to the text, right? The visual for her is really, is leading it, right? Yeah, yeah. And she said that if you can write and if you can draw, then it's silly not to do both, mm -hmm. which is an interesting way of thinking about it. So this is a memoir of her life, and it's particularly her life uh, during the Iranian Revolution, which occurred in the end of the 70s into 1980 or so, at which point she is about 10 years old. Yeah. She's 10 when the revolution breaks out. And so to talk about her life is, to, is also just to talk about the plot of the memoir. At least as she presents it to us, right? Yeah, because she said that some of the details have been changed or consolidated to make it a better story. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, one of the reasons why she was telling this story is in order to inform a 
Western, so to speak, audience who were filled with prejudices about Iranians as all being terrible people, as terrorists, etc., uh, of, of showing them a more rich picture of what Iran was like. Yeah. And and like doing two things, right? Because on the one hand, I think we have to understand it as part of like Iranian diasporic writing that's dealing with, like you said, tremendous prejudice against Iranian people after the revolution, right? But also it comes out originally in French around 2000 to 2004, right? So in the context of 9-11, right? And the aftermath of that and um, a more generalized xenophobia um, and Islamophobia, right? We have to read it in that frame too, I think, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. So Margie, as she goes by in the book, which, you know, maybe a somewhat distinct character from Marjan, the author, she's from an upper middle class family in Tehran, in the capital of Iran. And after the revolution has happened at the beginning of the book, well, life has changed. And the very first chapter is about the veil and it's how all the schoolgirls now wear the veil. The very first panel is a picture of her in the veil. And the second panel is a depiction of all of her schoolmates, you know, four of her friends. Uh, and you can't really tell them apart. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And this is this is a, you know a very striking sort of opening sentence for the book, although it's one that the text, of course, doesn't pull attention to. What do you mean? It's a striking sentence. Well, I mean visually, mm. the image of her, and then the image of four other girls who are very hard to distinguish from her because they're all yeah. wearing the same outfit. They all have fairly similar hair. Yeah. Their faces are all you know reduced to round. It's a very simple cartoonish style. Yeah. But the text is, you know, this is me when I was 10 years old. This is in 1980. And this is a class photo. I'm sitting on the far left so you don't see me. I, You can just see a bit of her shoulder. Yeah, because it's like four and a half figures there. You know, I was just struck by that, right? Because it's a question of like, I don't know, there's there's individuality that the text is giving us. But there's this, as you said, there's this sense in which the images are not differentiated from one another. There's this kind of enforced anonymity that comes from the veil. Um, and she's she's leading with that very purposefully. Yes, because we're looking at how life has changed since the revolution. Mm -hmm. For an audience that isn't as familiar with graphic novels, Mm -hmm. like there is information that's being very strongly conveyed in the first two panels Mm -hmm. that isn't being conveyed in the words, in the narration that's that's written right above them. And I want to highlight that just as a way of saying we might have some difficulty analyzing the entirety of the text in this. You know, we it's a lot easier for us to talk about words and read aloud words, but to get across the visual Mm. is a lot trickier in a podcast format. Yeah, I think that's really true. And that's why there are a couple of moments in this book that I really would like us to talk about where I'd love for us to describe the visual layout. Um, one of them is this um, panel where um, God is in the panel with her, right? And there's all kinds of interesting things to say about that. Like he doesn't speak, so you wouldn't, to reading it aloud doesn't really let you convey what's happening there. Um, and another one is where she refers to taking a trip with her parents. And during the time they're away is when the Iran-Iraq war breaks out. And there's, so there's a lot that's unsaid, but the image, which is a full page image, is a really striking one. So I think maybe we could find a couple of opportunities to to draw out the visual, um, at least in an ekphrastic kind of way, like putting it into words. Yeah, we will we, we'll try our best. <sighs> but anyway, back to back to what's going on. So so we're going to be looking at in the first half of the book all the ways that life changes as Islamic fundamentalists win control of the government after the revolution, as social freedoms become more and more restricted, as the war with Iraq starts, you know, those are going to have many changes to Margie and to her family's life and to her neighbor's life and and to the society at large. Her parents, who, uh, you know, she lives with her mother and father, she is 10, uh, they are often out protesting the fundamentalist regime, and they encourage her to be independent and and in, she is like she she's a, a very striking character who is not shy about sharing her beliefs. She is always saying what's on her mind and saying it loudly, um, mm-hmm. and it's very charming in a way. Yeah, and it gets her in trouble sometimes. And it definitely gets her in trouble. So they worry about her safety. Like that's an increasingly dangerous way to be in the world. And you know she gets kicked out of schools and she gets into trouble with all sorts of official people along the way. So. When she turns 14, they decide that it would be safest and best to send her to a French school in Vienna. And that's the end of the first half of the book, which was originally published separately in English. The second half of the book starts by exploring what happens when she gets to Vienna. She makes some friends. She struggles with being an outsider to the culture that she's living in. And yet, you know, as she's getting acclimated to European life, she increasingly feels like an outsider to the Iranian culture that 
she's left behind, but that she still feels like she should be a part of. She's also dealing with all the usual teenager stuff, dating, school, drugs. After she's there for a few years, when she's basically finished with her schooling, she reaches a crisis point. Most of her friends have graduated and left, and she's got a terrible landlady uh, who eventually she just sort of snaps and talks back to, and Mm -hmm. the rest of her safety net has more or less shriveled up, and so she ends up spending a few months living on the street until she catches ill and ends up in the hospital. And once she's out, she reconnects with her family. Everybody's been worried about her, of course, and she decides that it would be best for her to go back to Iran. But back home now, you know, it's many years later and the war is over and Iran has changed quite a bit. Things have settled down, but, you know, a lot of people were lost during the war. A lot of dissidents were imprisoned or killed or left the country. And the whole country just seems exhausted. Uh, Eventually, she goes to university to study art. She meets and marries another student named Reza. Uh, But the marriage quickly falls apart. And when she graduates, she divorces Reza. And the family agrees that Iran is not a good place for someone like her to be in. So she goes to Strasbourg in France to continue studying art. And that's where the memoir ends. Yeah. So that the, you know, the first part as it was published in English and the second part both end with her departing from the country, but she's in a very different place in those two different moments. Yeah. There are some really interesting formal echoes like that. I I also noticed this time around that the very first chapter or section or however you want to call it is called The Veil. And there is another section called The Veil later on. It's in it's in the second book. It's right before she goes to Iran again. She comes to get her things. And right before, like the very end of the chapter of The Veil is when she puts the veil back on again. And it, it's a really interesting panel. It takes up two thirds of the page and it's her looking at herself in the mirror. So we see her only in the mirror. And it's a, as a line of text at the top of the frame and a line of text at the bottom of the frame. It says, and so much for my individual and social liberties, dot, dot, dot. And at the bottom, I need it so badly to go home. Yeah. So it's like a sacrifice she makes. It's a choice that she's making as well. I mean, it's a choice that is sort of forced upon her by her circumstances, I suppose. Mm-hmm. But but nevertheless, she's deciding to go back to a place where she'll have to wear the veil as opposed to being in a place and having the veil forced upon her. Yeah. It's like, it's a, I mean, I, want to, I don't mean this in a negative way. It's a very overdetermined symbol in Persepolis, the veil. Yes. And I don't mean to take away from the unhappiness that comes through, you know, in the passages where she's talking about this enforced practice. But I also know that um, I was talking to a friend who teaches Persepolis, um, has taught it a couple of times in the past in the context of a course on Islamic world literature. And she said the students really, you know, gave this book a tough time. They were very frustrated by the ways in which it seemed to them to be kind of a reductive take or in some ways a very elitist take and diasporic and oriented toward a Western audience in ways that they were sometimes troubled by. Um, and the very, the tremendous emphasis on the veil as kind of a, a very overdetermined signifier, that seemed to them part of that. And thinking about the French audience of this work initially, I mean, it's originally published in French, you know, for, for, for French readership in the first instance, right? Is, is interesting, right? Especially if you think about it in the context of how secularism has been talked about in France over the past two decades. Uh, I don't, I mean, it sounds negative as I'm saying, but I mean, just mean, we have to read it in that framework too. Like we can't read this in a naive way. It's, it's, it's talking to a, a really complicated political moment and set of moments in the early part of the 21st century. Yeah. And, and she's, you know, obviously very much aware of that. <laughs> oh, yeah. She's, she's talked about this in interviews about, oh, yeah. about both her sense of the veil and also her sense of uh, the French government's attempts to ban the veil and so forth. And yeah, she, does, she, she has no truck with that either. Like, I don't mean to be reductive about her position on this, but it's like, it's really interesting for those who are like sort of following how, um, how secularism intersects with the expression of religion in the public sphere in a range of countries. Like, for example, she doesn't do, I mean, I don't fault her for this, but she doesn't say anything at all about the extent to which women wearing the veil was understood as a political act, an act of protest in the earliest months of the Iranian revolution. Like, you know, so, it, so it's it's not as simple as like, you know, there are the good communists and the bad mullahs. Like, there was a kind of, 
a shared movement in which women's participation deployed religious forms in a really interesting way. Anyway, I mean, I don't mean to fault the book for this, but like, it, it's a very, I guess what I mean is that it would be wrong, it would be a bad idea, I think, to read this as an account of the revolution without thinking about it as a very deeply personal and situated from a child's point of view, uh, take on the revolution. So it's filtered through a very particular kind of subject position. Um, and then also speaking to audiences in the ways we were talking about. Well, that's certainly true. And and, and I don't think it tries to pretend to be otherwise. Mm-hmm. Like it, it has its political aims. It's a memoir. It's trying to make some points to a particular audience, which is not an Iranian audience, first and foremost. Mm-hmm. And I think it does try to introduce a lot of nuance into how people who aren't from a culture where the veil is part of, like, understand how they can, how we can, or Mm -hmm. I can Mm -hmm. understand Mm -hmm. uh, the veil and how it may have worked for people that she knew. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot about later on, after people have become more accustomed to the veil, I guess, the the sense that the veil became a way of showing what the hairstyle Mm -hmm. was underneath it. There's a a nice page of sort of uh, x-rays through the, the, the veil that let you know how you can look at a veil and see more than just the shapelessness of it all. Yeah, when she's talking about drawing lessons, is that the passage you're thinking of in um, in the second part? Um, it's a little before that, actually. There is also yes, when she's in when she's in school, she she takes drawing lessons and they're expected to draw. <laughs> yeah, they can't have nudes anymore, so instead they have women wearing chadors, right? So they're basically like you know enveloped in fabric. Yeah, exactly. And she, and actually, she's talked about how that lack in her early art education was. One of the reasons why she wasn't terribly good at anatomy when she started making Persepolis. Yeah. Yeah. No, partly, partly that's true. Partly she's being self deprecating, right? She has this really interesting thing in this one interview that I think we both read where she's talking about the, uh, the choice of the style that she's done Persepolis in using black and white and also using this kind of sort of stripped down graphic kind of mode. And she says this, I, I thought really interesting thing. She says, I had always thought that what I had to say was too much. It was complicated with lots and lots of words. So, I had to make other choices because otherwise the rhythm of reading would be destroyed. That's why I went for something black and white, minimalistic. And I thought that was really interesting because in other words, she has a lot that she wants to say. There's a lot of text that needs to happen one way or the other, a lot of story. And so reducing the complexity of the visuals is a way to support that story better. I mean, you who've read more of these kinds of things, does that seem to you interesting? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That that resonates with me. I also have to say I have a, a strong fondness for the simpler style of comic mm-hmm. artists. Like, I guess I tend to think of it in terms of sort of the comic strip traditions, like Peanuts, let's say, and the comic book traditions, mm-hmm. which is also a vast oversimplification and, and doesn't include non-American types of, of, of comic art. But I have a strong fondness for the more simplified Peanuts type stuff. Uh-huh. And this is very much in line with that. And yeah, you get a very simplified palette. Uh, Scott McCloud, who's uh, a really well-known uh, comics theorist, talks about how the reduced image of a cartoonish face allows the reader to identify with it more because you're not being distracted by the specificity mm-hmm. as much of that individual face. And I don't know, maybe that's just something that appeals to me. But I also like the way that this kind of artwork can convey certain types of information. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm told it's a lot like Persian art traditions, but I also think of it in terms of medieval art traditions. Mm -hmm. There's a really interesting panel where she's, or set of panels, where she's talking with a friend and the friend's father or uncle, I forget, was a martyr. Mm -hmm. And as she's hearing the story, the depiction of Margie gets smaller and smaller in relationship to the girl who's the same age. Mm -hmm. like They are the same in the first panel. And then as she sees the story, Margie just shrinks. And it's very, it's fairly subtle. I I certainly didn't notice it the first time I read it, but I'm now thinking, oh yeah, no, that's, that's just showing her internal state by having the character look like she's just getting smaller and smaller in this way that, you know, a medieval manuscript might not be interested in perspective, but be interested in showing the proportionality of the two different characters. That's really neat. I hadn't thought about it that way. And, you know, you're making me reflect now when you're mentioning like peanuts and things like that, right? Because I had said before, oh, I have very little knowledge of graphic novels or like have read very few comics as an adult. But in childhood, I read tons and tons and tons and tons of these books of like peanuts and other kinds of comics. I mean, of that sort and and like actual comics in the paper. So in a weird kind of way, I was when I was reading Persepolis, I'm like, yeah, there's a kind of a a sense of familiarity about it. And it must come from that experience, which I had not thought about for so many years. 
Um, and also, you know, I wonder if that, how can I put it, this use of a stripped down style that evokes comic traditions that are, are oriented toward children is in some ways particularly resonant, especially in the first part of Persepolis where we're talking about childhood, childhood perspectives, a, a world that Margie inhabits in this very peculiar kind of way. Like we as readers are coming to understand the world that's changing, the revolution that's unfolding around her. And um, she herself is only grappling with that. So in a weird kind of way, the reader and the child Margie are in a comparable kind of position, at least in the early parts of the book. I wonder if that is something that's going on there. I'm not sure if that was the intent, but I think it does work that way. And I think a lot of that allows us an easy way in, in, mm-hmm. a, in a way that it might not if it were a more realistically drawn work or or, or more complexly drawn work, let's say. Mm-hmm. Margie, as a 10-year-old, tends to think of things in very stark black and white terms, right? Mm-hmm. And part of the course of the memoir is her learning to add nuance to it. But when she's thinking that way, she thinks of these big ideas in terms of very graphic images. And by graphic, I mean like graphic design images, Mm -hmm. although some of them are also graphic in terms of violence. So there's a chapter called The Party, uh, page 40, and it begins with the text, after Black Friday, there was one massacre after another, many people were killed. And the illustration for that is this sort of sideways four rows of people, of -hmm. of men, who all look the same, Mm -hmm. with their eyes tilted up so to speak, to to indicate that they are dead and their and their mouths agape, and it's just it's just a way of imagining what a lot of people being killed might look like, mm-hmm. but it's incredibly symbolic, right? It's the same person just copied again and again and again. Mm-hmm. It, it's a very quick and easy way to read that, and to think of it as immensity without thinking of it as as being sort of specific, which plays very well with how Margie at ten might be thinking about it. Yeah, there's no individuality to it. It's just the idea of many, many people, right? Yeah, yeah. So we're reading this as part of our cluster on revolution. And of course, it's connected with the events of the Iranian Revolution, which I know very little about. Well, it looks pretty good at the outset of this book, you know, like there's this exchange that Margie has with her grandmother that I think is so interesting and so kind of telling. It's um, it's actually in the chapter called Persepolis, right? So it's kind of carrying the weight of the work as a whole in some sense. The um, grandmother is talking to Margie and says, I'm so happy that there's finally a revolution because the Shah, and there's a dot, 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 and Margie says, I'm hungry. Right? And then the next panel, the grandmother says, I bought you some books. You'll see why the people are revolting. And Margie's just paying no attention to what the grandmother is saying. And so it's an interesting moment where clearly somebody that Margie enormously looks up to and loves, her grandmother, is in favor of the revolution. Right? She sees it as necessary, appropriate, a good thing, a thing that people have been waiting for for a long time. And the context within which she's talking about that is a celebration at Persepolis. So Persepolis is the old ceremonial capital of the Persian Empire, right? So founded sometime in the 6th century BC, right? So it's like 2,500 years old, right? And what the grandmother is talking about when she's talking to the young Margie there is not the ancient history of Persepolis so much as a very recent celebration that it happened in 1971 when the Shah at that time, Mohammad Reza, had had a, a huge celebration, the 2500th anniversary of the Persian Empire. Um, and like, look it up sometime. It's like the most like crazy despotic spectacle ever, basically. Um, but it was mainly for an international audience. And so heads of state came in from far away. He established kind of this kind of temporary tent city out in the ruins in the desert um, and made this really magnificent celebration. And it was seen almost immediately as not just catering to an international population at the expense of the nation, but also like an ostentatious display of wealth in ways that did not play well domestically. And so Persepolis here, like in this chapter, but also in the title of the work as a whole, is doing this really interesting kind of work. On the one hand, it's gesturing at that celebration and the extent to which that played a kind of precipitating role uh, leading to the revolution in 79. But it's also, I think in some ways, kind of serving as a touchstone for Persian national history, Iranian national identity, a sense of who these people are apart from the Islamic government that came to power in the 70s. So the, the, so it, it's a really, I think it's a really interesting moment in the book, this exchange. 
So the revolution itself happened in 1979 when the Pahlavi dynasty um, was overthrown and replaced by an Islamic Republic. And to, order, to understand this moment, like without going into a lot of detail, it's necessary to have a little bit of sense of the backstory. So there had been a dynasty um, in the 19th and early 20th century called the Qajar dynasty. And that was overthrown by the Shah who was deposed's father. Uh, he was called Reza Shah. He had been a military officer. He was supported by the British, overthrew the Qajars, and established the Pahlavi dynasty. But he got in all kinds of trouble in 1941 because he kept Iran neutral during World War II because he was very pro-German. And the British were like, no, that's not okay. So they ousted him and installed Mohammad Reza, his son, as the Shah. And this is the person who was the Shah up through 79. So the next crucial thing that happened was in 1953, the it had a kind of a constitutional monarchy in Iran, and the democratically elected government um, moved to nationalize the oil industry. And the British really did not like this at all. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Yeah. And so they got the CIA to overthrow the government. Uh, as, which is as what they're there for. <laughs> yeah. So basically, the CIA and British intelligence overthrew the government. And this is not a rumor or anything like that, because at the 60th anniversary of that, or 65th anniversary of it, sometime in the recent past, a lot of that documentation was published by the CIA. So it's like, it's not a secret, right, that this happened. Anyway, so you can imagine this left a really bad taste in the Iranian people's mouths, right? So demonstrations start getting underway in the late 70s, starting in October of 77, and they really take off in 78. And that celebration back at Persepolis in 1971 kind of contributed to that brewing sense of unhappiness in the 70s. And the trigger, and this is a trigger that gets actually mentioned in Persepolis, is the burning of the Rex Cinema. There was a movie going, and some people, a group of four men, um, barred the doors and lit the place up, and hundreds of people died. And there was a lot of uncertainty about who exactly had done it, who was, there were trials and so on, but, you know, uh, was it the secret police? Was it revolutionaries? Who was it who did it? However you look at it, it was um, a transformative moment that energized people into really dramatic activity, strikes, demonstrations. And finally, the Shah leaves Iran to go into exile in January of 1979. And that's when the Ayatollah Khomeini came back to Iran, invited by the government, greeted by a huge crowd, literally millions of people. And he comes to power in February of 79. And Iran becomes an Islamic republic, not by fiat, but by a national referendum. And there's a new constitution. It's a peaceful revolution. I think people sometimes lose sight of that. It's a very organic kind of revolution that happens with a whole range of people participating in the revolution, people who are religiously motivated, the clerical castes, but also people who are communists who are inhabiting different parts of the sort of political landscape, you know, leftists of different sorts. So it's a very heterogeneous kind of community that's participating in revolution in these early stages. And then it changes. The aftermath becomes very different, and that clerical um, hierarchy becomes absolutely dominant. And um, there's a lot to say about that. In describing it, I'm reminded of, you know, some of the stuff we were talking about in connection with the Haitian Revolution when we were reading C.L.R. James's Black Jacobins, where there, too, you have a certain set of alliances that exist and those change over time. So, too, in the Iranian Revolution, that shifts very dramatically. And the other deeply destabilizing thing that happens, and I think probably really contributes meaningfully to this consolidation of the uh, religious hierarchy, is an invasion by Iraq in September of 1980. So this is um, like a year and a few months after the Islamic Republic comes into effect. Iran's neighbor, Iraq, you know, Saddam Hussein, decides this is a great time to try to grab some territory. Uh, oil-rich territory. Right? It's always about that. Um, and that results in the Iran-Iraq war that went on from 1980 to 1988. Huge loss of lives. It finally ends in a ceasefire. The borders end up where they were. Millions and millions and millions of people dead. So it's um, it's a pretty horrible story. So so that's the that's the backdrop. That's the kind of crucible that Satrapi's memoir comes out of, right? And she knows the revolution the way a child knows the revolution. But she also has the knowledge that comes from all those years afterward, and especially those years of living in exile. I think so. It's so it's on the one hand a child's perspective on the revolution, but on the other hand, it's a retrospective looking back on the revolution that comes from the experience of exile, and then, as you were saying before, that return that she makes years later when the people are exhausted, not just by the revolution and its aftermath, but by the war with Iraq. Well, it's a child's understanding of it, but it's also from her parents, right? Mm-hmm, who who mm-hmm. 
uh, were part of some of the revolutionary efforts, but f- from very much a leftist perspective. Yeah, they're communists, right? Yeah, and they feel completely betrayed by what they consider to be the Islamic takeover. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, their their sense seems to be we did all this work, and now somebody else has come in and is in charge. And, and that's true enough. I mean, those people get squeezed out, right, as power gets consolidated more narrowly. Yeah. But in a sense, like, the, the, the memoir doesn't present any other perspective on the revolution. No. Which I'm, I'm sure there are, I'm sure other perspectives are available. But, oh, yeah. But, um, but that is the one, you know, that's, that's sort of where it's coming from. So, so, it, so it is the child's perspective, but it's also tempered from the adult understandings that are being uh, overheard or that are, you know, that they, that they try to explain to Margie. Mm-hmm. It's not just sort of all in her head. It's not entirely filtered through her. But it is definitely, like, that is a part of it. Uh, part of it is absolutely the fact that, you know, she is a child. And one of the things that fascinated me on this rereading of it was all the ways that the children play at some of the terrors of revolution mm-hmm. and, 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 and its aftermath. So, you know, they they play at being tortured, which is what we started with. You know, when she's playing at like, I'm going to take a long bath to go through the torture that my grandfather went through so I can understand it better, perhaps. They play at torturing others. They they invent games of torture. They invent games of martyrs. They play at maybe less play, but they, they try to uh, attack another child who is son of uh, somebody from the secret police and they are stopped just in time before they they actually do physical harm to the kid uh, by by Margie's mother but the playing at torturing because you know this is sort of what's in the air what's all around her it's upsetting to think about a child like oh I'm going to torture you now and now you're going to torture me or whatever mm-hmm. but it's what's happening around her and it's this way that a child can understand it and and to think about these ideas in hopefully most of the time a sort of safe way yeah I, I'm just looking at the at the panels um, of the scene you're describing and it's really striking as you're saying this is how children process what they're hearing about right and at the very top of that page, um, it's page 53, um, the top panel that has a line across the top that these stories had given me new ideas for games. And then the kids are talking to one another. And she says, the one who loses will be tortured. And the kid says, yeah. And the other one's like, what kind of torture? And then they describe different kinds of torture, the twisted arm, the mouth filled with garbage, different things. And then in the middle panel, at the very center of the page, she writes, but it didn't last. I was overwhelmed. It shows herself before a mirror weeping. And so we learn about these excesses, about these extremes that take place in the course of the revolution, but it's filtered through this individual experience. And, you know, we've been talking about it being child experience, but I think also super important thinking about it being female experience. I and mean, she talks a lot about the ways in which the revolution particularly restricts women's experience. And I'm struck by the fact, I mean, I haven't gone through this methodically, so this is just anecdotal, but an awful lot of these Iranian memoirs that we see, they're women. Like I'm thinking about things like Nafisi's reading Lolita in Tehran or, you know, other kinds of um, fiction and nonfiction accounts that I've seen by Iranian authors, a lot by women. And I'm wondering if this is this is where the memoirs are coming from and the fiction is coming from, or if it's like these appeal to an audience that is a Western audience that's interested in hearing about how Islamic regimes marginalize women and make them suffer. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying that there isn't real hardship, but it's hard to disambiguate the appetite of the market from what's coming from the the writers. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's certainly possible that it could be market related. It also just seems to me to be demographic related. Like if, if Marjan had been a mm, boy, yeah, she wouldn't have been able to yeah, leave the country no, when right. she did. She would have been conscripted into the army. She probably wouldn't have survived. Because she, she says, remember she talks about going to the airport that first time, there's a whole bunch of like, what is it, 13 year old boys or 12 year olds? Because there was a limit like at, at, at age 13 or 14, males couldn't leave the country anymore. Exactly. That's so poignant. And so the male version of Marjan Satrapi would not have had anything like this experience and mm. probably wouldn't have survived. Mm. Mm. The other thing I was thinking about thinking with the children playing at these various terrible things is is how much it seemed like my experience reading about them. Like you read this book, if it's not assigned to you, you're reading this book because you're intrigued by this story of what it was like to go through as a child the Iranian revolution. And 
you're, you're going to encounter all of these terrible things. You're going to encounter torture. You're going to encounter just awful, awful incidences, but you're doing it from this safe space of reading. You know, reading is a kind of play. It's a kind of way of dealing with these large, traumatic, terrible events in a relatively safe space, which is a lot like how Marjan is, you know, is also processing them, which struck me as an interesting other way that we are encouraged to identify with her, right? Yeah, no, I think that's right. And one of the other ways in which um, we get a real sense of Margie as being in some ways lined up with the reader, learning and being responsible for what she learns in something like the way that the reader is too, is in the way she hears things, not just from her parents, not just from her very beloved grandmother, but also from other family members, including her uncle Anoush. Um, And we get quite a bit of his backstory uh, as um, Margie hears about it from him, um, how he had been uh, in political exile in Russia for a period of time, how he'd been imprisoned in the past. And so she's getting all of these stories from him about the past. And he says this to her. He says, I tell you all this because it's important that you know our family memory must not be lost, even if it's not easy for you, even if you don't understand it all. And she's sitting at his feet as he's sitting in a chair and she says, don't worry, I'll never forget. And that's the last panel on the bottom right of of that page. And they're sitting against a black background. And it strikes me as such an important moment because in that moment, she's almost kind of a vessel, not just for what he's saying, but for, as he says, our family memory. Like she has an obligation to carry that forward. And she takes on that obligation. Don't worry, I'll never forget. And so as the reader, too, you're kind of like drawn into that somehow. Um, She's got this very close relationship with her uncle Anoush, who I think in some ways sees her as another daughter, like he has two daughters from the past that he hasn't seen for many years um, because of, again, that condition of exile. And as time goes by, he ends up being imprisoned again. And there's this very poignant scene that takes place um, a little bit later in the book. He's imprisoned. He's not going to get out of that prison. And only one member of the family can go. Margie's father says, Anoush has the right to only one visitor, and it's you he wants to see. So she gets dressed, goes to the prison. And again, we have one whole page. This is on page 69, where it's just uh, the uncle, Anoush, and Margie in the prison. So she comes in in the first panel, and a voice from off, off screen says, 10 minutes. And he reaches out his arms to her, sitting on the edge of his cot, and says, what a beautiful dress, what a beautiful girl. And in the next panel, she's sitting on his lap, and he says, you know, you've honored me with your visit. And um, they have this conversation, and then the next page at the top, it says, that was my last meeting with my beloved Anoush, because he's been executed. And that's a very powerful I want to say powerful and transformative moment. It's it's a moment that punctuates a very transformative period, I think, in Margie's life, where um, there's this uncle she's clearly devoted to, he's devoted to her, and she's learned a lot from him, and it ends tragically. And this has a lot of impact on her. And one of the kinds of impact it has on her is this when she, a couple panels later, tells God to go away. God comes to her in the night, and she says, shut up, you get out of my life. I never want to see you again. Get out. And then after that, I was lost without any bearings. What could be worse than that? Which is immediately answered because then yeah. in, you know, in that same panel, a voice from afar is Margie. Run to the basement, we're being bombed. <laughs> yeah, like, so. It just gets worse, right? But like, but but I mean in terms of her instrumentality, like her role as a kind of a vessel for her people, like for her uncle and specifically in that scene. But remember he says our family's memory. Like there's this sense in which she's meant to be the one passing on something. So, so it's so it's really curious, right? Because this memoir, on the one hand, is very—I don't want to say narcissistic, but it's like it's very much the memoir of a particular person, an individual person, and what she goes through and her her transformations over time. But it's also, to some extent, purporting to tell the story of her people, and we can understand that narrowly as like her family, what her uncle charges her with. But it could also be like her people in some other sense, and 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 that's that's an odd and interesting aspect of the book, understanding like who. When she's not just speaking for herself, who is she speaking for? Whose memories is she speaking for? Um, What's she carrying? So one of the things that really struck me on this read was, okay, yes, it is her story. It is also the story of her family. It's also, to a different degree, the story of Iran during those years. It's also the story of Tehran, I sort of realized, because that is where most of the scenes take place in in Iran. Oh, yeah. And they occasionally go out to other parts of the country or you hear news about 
you know, bombings happening in other parts of the country, but really it's focused on Tehran. And I think the nicer parts of Tehran. Oh, yeah. And Tehran is depicted as being a very specific kind of city. It's a very cosmopolitan one, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. One where you can still get cassette tapes of pop stars in the middle of the revolution and then the oppression of free speech that's going on. It's one that has a thriving intellectual leftist community. And it's one that is multicultural because there's a, a haunting, terrible chapter where a bomb drops and it it destroys the house of their next door neighbor. Yeah. And you know, she's running home and it's not until she's there that she finds out that it was the next door neighbor and not her house. But the next door neighbors who get killed in this are Jewish. Uh-huh. And it's this really interesting moment of, of underlining that, you know, it, she, it's very quiet about it. But it's this moment of saying, well, no, this is a, a city inhabited by a bunch of different people. And they got along, or at least in terms of her family. You know, this was a, a th- these were family friends. This was an extra neighbor. This was all part of the community. They are different people. They're from a, a you know, a different faith and, and whatnot. But it's a cosmopolitan city in that sense. It's a city where all sorts of different people gather together. Yeah. Like the, the Jewish minority, especially in, like in other parts of Iran too, but in Tehran in particular, it was like, like existed for an incredibly long time, right? Um, also, the Armenian Christian community. I mean, there's a kind of a heterogeneity to Tehran of that day that she evokes um, that would change over time in the wake of the revolution, right? But I think that's also another meaning for the title, for Persepolis, the city of mm-hmm. the Persians, right? It's mm-hmm. now, I mean, there is a historic Persepolis, but it's also a portrait of this city in a mm-hmm. certain way, and mm-hmm. the glories that it had so recently had and, you know, potentially could continue to have. Yeah, it's neat to think about that. Like, is is Persepolis like a real place or is Persepolis a kind of diasporic ideal? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. That's really neat. You mentioned that she says to God to go away. And we haven't really brought up her conversations with God in the early parts of the book. Yeah. It's really interesting the ways in which this book deals with religion, because it's on the one hand, there from the outset in a really personal and affective and really engaged kind of way. It's sometimes funny, but sometimes very poignant. And then it's also there in the apparatus of the revolution. And, and that feels very different. And she's very negative about that. For good reasons. But it, it, I mean, it's interesting that that sort of God is there. She early on imagines that she is going to be the next prophet. She says, yeah, she says, I w-, she says it beautifully, she says, I was born with religion. Yes. Uh, the image in the frame is of her as an infant. And partly it's ridiculous, right? Um, a ridiculous fantasy of a child. But it tells you something about her and her sense of of religion being immediately present in some kind of way. This is not a child who who thinks that anything is off the table for her future. <laughs> like her her mother, you know, wanted her to be an independent woman eventually, and yes, she's going to go as far down that path as she can in her imagination. Like she doesn't imagine herself as God, but the next closest thing. Yeah, it's because she has this really powerful sense of right and wrong. Right? She's when she talks about you know like herself as wanting to be a prophet, she wants to you know because she wants to fix things. She wants to make it so that her grandmother won't have pain in her knees, or so that um. You know, her maid will be able to eat dinner with the family and not in the kitchen. Like, it's all motivated by justice and a desire for good, right? So that's the kind of playful parts of it. But it's interesting how her relationship with God, like, shows up in these really, like, poignant kinds of moments. Um, Like, we were talking um, before about that scene where she and her friends are engaged in sort of torture play, right? And she's crushed by this and and goes to her mother. Um, And her mother is able to comfort her a little bit, but the real comfort she finds is privately. And again, this is a panel that's at the very end, uh, the bottom right-hand side of the page. So it's a kind of closing panel. After that exchange with the children and then going to her mother for comfort, she says this, the words are at the top of the frame. I didn't know what justice was. Now that the revolution was finally over once and for all, I abandoned the dialectical materialism of my comic strips. The only place I felt safe was in the arms of my friend. And there's this beautiful image of, it's God, right? Who appears as kind of like an old man, right? But also almost as a mountain or something like that, or almost like as a, it, it, it's colored white, but it's almost like the, the black figures of the chadors we see elsewhere, right? He's like, almost as though he's draped with 
godhood, right? And you could just make out the outline of his arms, almost as though it was beneath a veil. And um, Margie is tucked in his arms, like as if she'd fallen asleep smiling in his arms. And this idea of the arms of my friend, it's a really interesting way of describing that scene because it evokes um, uh, Sufi Islam uses this language of the friend, which you find uh, particularly in Persian poetry, like Rumi or Hafiz or people like this, who, who use this term, the friend or my friend as a synonym for God. Right? So, so she's got this very warm, I think, affective piety that I think is actually kind of serious in here in some ways, right? It's like deeply felt at least. Um, but on the other hand, she's not going to hesitate to condemn the hypocritical expression of religion in post-revolutionary Iran. Yeah. And this comes out in a really interesting scene towards the end of the book when she's applying to get into the art school yeah. in Tehran. And she passes the test and is very excited because that's a hard thing and there aren't a lot of seats. She has to go to the doctrinal test now. But yes, then there's that. And it's like, <laughs> oh no, she has to memorize all the prayers in Arabic, which she doesn't speak. And she has to remember all the names of the martyrs and whatnot. And, and she just... In classic form, she speaks her mind in the interview. Horrifying. <laughs> yeah. So she, she just can't she can't do the studying. So when she goes in, she just yeah, she said speaks her mind and and uh she's asked uh Miss Satrophy, I see from your file that you have lived in Austria. Did you wear the veil there? And she says, No. I've always thought that if women's hair posed so many problems, God would certainly have made us bald. And then do you know how to pray? No. And may I ask why? Like all Iranians, I don't understand Arabic. If praying is talking to God, I prefer to do it in a language that I know. I believe in God, but I speak to him in Persian. Mm -hmm. The Prophet Muhammad said, God is closer to us than our jugular veins. God is always with us. He is in us, right? Thank you, Ms. Satrapi. You can go now. And she leaves thinking, oh, I blew it. I, I did everything wrong. But a few months later, I learned that via the director of the Department of Art that the mullah who had interviewed me had really appreciated my honesty. Apparently, he'd even said that I was the only one who didn't lie. I was lucky. I had stumbled on a true religious man. Isn't that neat? It was such an interesting twist because this is one of the first times you hear of somebody in that kind of position. A of true religious man. Power. Yeah. And yeah. in, in a positive way. Like he's yeah. got a very strong set of beliefs, but he is doing it sort of for the right reasons. Well, it's not just lip service for him, right? It's not just literal, right? It's, it's, uh, which he says that about, you know, God being closer to your jug. I mean, that's a, that's a really faithful statement on her part. And he hears it as that. It's, it's not like it redeems every religious leader in Iran by any stretch, but it does show that there are people who are in those positions who are navigating it in a way that isn't quite how we would imagine. And I mm -hmm. think especially for, you know, the intended audience of, of people outside of Iran who, who, who have these cartoonish images mm -hmm. of what all these people must be, all these people must be mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. it, it really does a good job of quickly introducing some nuance to that. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. I was really struck by that, too. So it's worth talking a little bit about some of the things that uh, Satrapi has done since this was published. Uh, she's written a few more comic books, including two that are kind of extensions of uh, not, not quite the story, but it, stories from her family. Mm. One of them is called Embroideries, which is a really lovely piece about a, a party. It's just a conversation at a party with six women, including her and her mother and her grandmother and a few of the other aunts and so forth, talking about all sorts of things. Um, the title, Embroideries, uh, comes from a particular type of surgery that some women get when they're going back on the market, so oh to speak, my. and they want to tighten things up. Oh <laughs> I did uh, not get that. <laughs> no. Well, if you <laughs> read it, it's, it's made quite clear. And that's something that the grandmother jokes about, mm. uh, the delightful grandmother uh, from Persepolis. Uh, talks about that. It's a really interesting book. It talks quite a lot about the, the amongst other things, the sexual uh, desires of these older women, of you know, women in their 60s and 70s. And, and uh, it's really good in that way. Uh, it's, a, it's just a really charming and a somewhat different style. It's not in panels. It's much more free-flowing. So all the conversation and all the drawings sort of flow into each other like a conversation, oh, right? Neat. Because a conversation, you jump in, you jump out at any point. It doesn't make as much sense to put it into panels. That sounds very cool. It's super great. Another one that she has written is called Chicken with Plums. And it is the story, uh, it's presented as uh, a great grand uncle of hers, I think. Um, but basically, he is a musician. His instrument, the tar, breaks. And he tries to get a new one. And 
can't get one that sounds good. And so he decides he's going to die. Mm. And in eight days, he does. Uh, he just basically spends the time in his bed. And through that, you explore the relationships he has with various family members. It's a really interesting story and a really interesting way of unfolding the narrative. It, it, it's jumping backwards and forwards in time in really interesting ways. Mm -hmm. Both of these books are, are short. They're, they're less than 100 pages, and, and they're both charming. Uh, so I, I recommend both of them to anybody who's enjoyed Persepolis. They sound good. Yeah. Um, she also uh, made a movie out of Persepolis, which she directed or co-directed, uh, which is also quite good. It's it's very similar. Like obviously some things were shuffled around to make it work as a movie, but it, you know, it's it's animated, it's that black and white style animation. They did a really good job transferring the images into animation, which is harder than it would seem mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. Um, but it it was very successful. It, it's totally worth watching. Uh, she's done a few movies since then. She, similarly, they made a they made a movie out of uh, Chicken with Plums, uh, although that is live action. And she has a movie that's uh, just about to go into wider release about the life of Marie Curie. Oh wow! Based on uh, another graphic novel by somebody else. Um, that movie uh, didn't get terribly good reviews when it was at the Toronto International Film Festival, but I don't know. You know, we'll see. We'll see. It still seems like an interesting project, and I could imagine her having some interesting things to say about Curie. So, yeah, there's a neat little allusion to Marie Curie in the first part of Persepolis when she's talking about. I don't remember exactly the passage, but she's talking about like basically women's education. Yeah. So it's it's been interesting, you know, realizing that she's been doing all sorts of different kinds of work. So when we decided to do this book, one of the things that was motivating us was that uh, there was a lot of rumbling about the U.S. going to war with Iran. Mm. Rumbling, which seems to have mostly fallen away at this moment because we're in the middle of a different crisis. Yeah, though the sanctions on Iran is causing incredible suffering, right? Because they can't get a lot of like medical equipment and stuff like that. That's certainly my understanding, that they're one of the countries that is doing the worst uh, with the yeah. with, with coronavirus. Well, a couple of days ago, there were satellite images of mass graves. Yeah. 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 So things have changed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was interesting to see a few scenes that felt unexpectedly um, yeah. current. Yeah. There's a scene where uh, the, the, where Margie and her mother are going shopping mm -hmm. and everybody is hoarding at the supermarket and there are two women yelling at each other, trying to grab the last bag of whatever. Right. And the, yes. And the mother is very dismissive of them, you know, hoarding and it's ridiculous and so forth. And then as soon as they're packing the car, they're like, she's like, well, we should probably go to the supermarket across the street and see if they have any more rice. <laughs> we can make sure we have enough, <laughs> which is, oh, that's a good, that's, yeah. we've all been there, I guess. Oh, yeah. Well, that's been going on. And also people fleeing. Right? I mean, this scene that you were just describing is in a chapter called The Jewels. And the reason it's called that is because a little later on in that same chapter, a dear friend of uh, Margie's mother, a person called Molly and her family, have had to flee from where a place where bombings have been taking place. And they end up staying with Margie's family for a little bit. And they haven't been able to take much with them, but they've got um, family jewels, which they can resell and try to establish themselves. So this idea of like... Um, people being displaced by circumstances outside of their control, a feeling of crisis, even though this is a very different kind of situation. This is a situation of wartime. Nonetheless, it's, it's something that's resonating with people right now, I think. And so... Yeah. And so we've decided to make a last minute interruption in our plans, let's say, and we're not going to immediately launch into our next cluster. Our next episode is going to be a special episode, I guess, a, a, a singleton, a one-off, where we're going to read The Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio. Yeah. And we want to read that for two reasons. I mean, not just because it's a book that talks about uh, pestilence. It's talking about the Black Plague of 1348, but also because it's about how people cope with it. And the way they deal with it is with story. Um, so we thought it would provide us a really interesting opportunity to talk about how people cope individually and also cope as communities collectively um, through story, um, through narrative, through literature. And through dirty jokes. And through and through getting it on, man. The, yeah, there's also a too. lot of messing around that goes on um, in the characters um, who are telling these stories. I mean, it's very discreet and very polite and genteel, but it's clear 
that they are finding ways to occupy themselves pleasurably. So, yeah. you know, maybe it'll inspire somebody. So that's going to be our next episode. And uh, we will get back to our regular, <laughs> our previously scheduled <laughs> programming immediately after that. With books on class. Well, we're going to be doing a cluster on the 19th century English novel, which turns out to be a cluster on class. Oh, yeah. We're going to start with Jane Austen's Emma. Which is incredibly exciting. It's a beautiful book. It's, I guess, I mean, I find it's a book that kind of drags in places, but there are parts of it that I absolutely love. So I think it's going to be really fun to talk about. And we haven't done a Jane Austen yet, which is ridiculous no. as we get towards 30 episodes. Um, <laughs> we're going to be looking at Charles Dickens and his Great Expectations which I am not looking forward to rereading because <laughs> oh. I don't like Dickens, but I'm sure it'll be fine. I'm, maybe I'll be, maybe, maybe this will be the time that I read Dickens and enjoy it. We'll find good parts in it for you. Yeah. And then we're going to be reading Vanity Fair by William Makepeace Thackeray. I've read that many years ago, but I haven't read it since then. So I'm actually really eager to go back to it. I've never read it, but I got really excited about reading C.L.R. James talking about having read it. So I'm super curious. Yeah, you were saying he was heavily into it, right? Yeah, it was his most important book as a child. That's so neat. Yeah. And uh, apparently it's very funny. Yeah, that I do remember. Good. Good, because I could use that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other thing in the Decameron. They're always like the re one of the reasons that some of the people remember that some of the stories are really dirty and body and hilarious because, you know, as they say, laughter is the best medicine. So that is an important part of what we do. Good. Well, I'm going to be looking forward to that. But in the meantime, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm or we're on Twitter at The Spouter and we'd love to hear from you. Show notes with links for anything we've mentioned in this episode will be at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 26. And The Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So until next time. Till next time. See you again at The Spouter Inn.